WWT presents Experts. Hey everyone, it's Matthew Coble, host of WWT Experts, uh, here with you as always to provide another great show for you. And so today, you know, as we all know, the retail sector is dynamic and an ever-evolving landscape. And there's rapid advancement of technology, and that's driving cybersecurity threats that retailers face that have become increasingly sophisticated. So today we're going to be delving into the most prevalent cyber threats impacting the retail industry, ransomware attacks that cripple operations, targeted phishing scams that exploit vulnerabilities in human behavior, and other things in between. So, you know, while the security risk that we're talking about here could be really profound and catastrophic at times for retailers and their financial stability, their brand reputation, and the trust they have with their customers, it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of great stuff going on out in the marketplace. So we're going to talk about some actionable strategies to mitigate the risks that we're talking about is to protect the business and really push forward uh, great brand experiences. One episode in a four-part series we have on retail, and the others are AI and data, cloud, unified commerce, and of course today we're talking about cybersecurity. With me, two experts from worldwide. First, Jay Custard is Chief Digital Advisor with WWT. He's an experienced uh, digital strategy and e-commerce executive, and he's really worked across multiple disciplines with companies of all sizes to transform retail on a global scale. Uh, he loves blending together user experience, analytics, marketing strategy, merchandising, and technology to optimize retail for our clients and their customers. Uh, delighted to have him here with us today. Jason Cook is also with us. He's a field chief information security officer at Worldwide Technology and has over 25 years of experience in the industry. Before joining us, uh, he was the chief information security officer for British Telecom Americas, the Chertoff Group, and Raising Canes. He's also served as a virtual CISO for several companies in mid-market and enterprise scale. Uh, and he's called upon frequently as a speaker in national and international security, IT, cybersecurity events and forums. And he's also often sought after by executive teams and boards to share his IT and cybersecurity expertise. Gentlemen, thanks for coming. Glad to have you. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Let's jump right in. So to set the stage, you know, let's really just start with an overview of the current cybersecurity landscape in the retail sector. You know, what are the most common threats retailers are seeing today and how have these threats evolved and advanced in the last several years? Yeah, if you told me a few years ago when I was owning a P&L that I'd be excited to sit here and talk about cybersecurity <laughs> now and retail growth, um, you know, I would have called you crazy. But I think well, here we are. Such a, yeah. Here we are, right? And I think it's because we get to work with people like Jason with the, the depth of knowledge and the things that we get to see within the the industry, right? As we sit with line of business owners and certainly the other side of the equation where Jason has much deeper experience on the CISO technology side. But what I would say is that I think we can all know the big, big chunks of things that are threatening the space, right? Around ransomware and malware and breaches and data, you know, being all proliferated across the internet. But I think the backdrop that, that Jason and I really kind of help focus on when we talk to our respective peers in the industry is this business tension that exists, the, the backdrop of why these things are so prevalent and why retail is so rich for this type of attack. It's because there's this balance and this tension as a line of business owner, right, there's more pressure to grow in retail than ever before, right? New customers, more repeat visits, larger baskets, new merchandise, personalized offer, collect more data, bring that data, monetize that data, grow, grow, grow at the speed of digital. And security, cybersecurity in particular, is always thought of as the other side of the equation of it's a, it's a drag, right? It's, it's, it's slowing me down. And I know Jason has much more of an understanding of how that works on the other side of this tension between growth and then the things that we need to do to be able to protect that growth. Right, Jason? No, oh, absolutely. I mean, retail companies, I would say, are actually at the forefront of digitizing how they operate, how they run themselves, trying to be more and more efficient with technology. But clearly then that, that ecosystem that they are operating themselves with a mixture of their third parties, which are typically technology companies, uh, with their supply chain, which are depending more and more on 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 a digital technology, and then clearly the digital experience that uh, their customers and their consumers are demanding. So when you put that together, and 
you then think about it from a cybersecurity perspective, um, often we use the phrase that the threat landscape or the opportunity for attack and opportunities for cyber criminals to take advantage of a company, well, their digital footprint is radically growing. And so as a result, cyber criminals, they're, you know, they're perhaps using the same techniques and procedures, but now at vast scale to compromise these retail companies. Yeah, and we're getting ready to enter into the season of retail where we introduce some of the most real risk that we ever can as we bring on more seasonal employees. We move faster to, to open up new ways of shopping as we get into this crucial holiday series. And, and as we think about that, like the business moves faster than we ever allow our IT and CISO partners to ever come along for the ride. And I think that's such a an amazing thing that we all have to think about because this isn't a, a biz, this isn't a, a problem that lives in within one domain, right? This is this is very much a macro business problem. Like like Peter Drucker said a long time ago in management, there are no finance problems, accounting problems, marketing problems. There are business problems. And I think in a world where retail is evolving as it is, and the things that Jason just outlined, cybersecurity is a business challenge and a problem that has to be managed from every part of the organization, not just one particular part of the group. And I think our business leaders need to know that in retail and prioritize that moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. We, we like to use a, a phrase now about securing altogether yeah. um, our approach here, especially when you're thinking of a digital company and the ecosystem that retailers operate in. And then when we think about that, we use a phrase now, uh, we always encourage our clients um, and we're supporting them with their cybersecurity challenges to think about the three R's. Um, one of the biggest R's is risk. Uh, and many, many times people have tried to put the technology risk in its own bucket and just leave it like that. Well, actually what we're encouraging companies to, to acknowledge, and to your point, Jay, is that one of the largest business risks that companies have, retailers have, is their digitization. Uh, and as a result, the cybersecurity risk that comes in because of that. And so that's a key area there. Then the other point is, uh, and it's, it's we, we, the headlines are no longer full because it's happening all the time with the incidents and breaches that retailers are suffering on the, on the, on the global um, uh, uh, stage. So the reality is it's not if, but when. So what are they doing? What is their resilience? How can they respond? How can they uh, deal with a challenge that they'll have either directly to themselves or to their ecosystem that they're supporting and plugged into and, and dependent on? And then the challenge is, of course, um, if one of the business risks is the cybersecurity dynamic and something is going to happen, um, then how resilient are they when they respond? And that's no longer just the IT challenge in the corner of an organization. It's a business challenge and it's a business risk that has to be met by the business uh, collectively. Yeah, one of the jokes that I had when we were talking about before the session is that you take that first part, that first R, risk, as a line of business owner, you know how I would define that risk? Someone like Jason coming to my office and saying, you can't do this, right? Or somehow going through an audit process or slowing it down, going through a prioritization or a security review. But that's the reality, right? The risk is not growing fast enough, not retaining customers, not growing more basket size, not doing these things, not opening up new and, and kind of emerging channels. And I think we have to change that perception within retail holistically that risk is shared across all of us. And it's not something that's a drag or, or, or a mop up operation that has to come later. Yeah. All right. Well, I love that you mentioned that idea, Jason, a minute ago of you know, being secure altogether, because I feel like that's an important principle. And Jay, I get that a lot of retailers, you know, security, I don't know, risk is all about business, not security, but security needs to become part of that risk sensibility. Uh, Jason, I wanna ask you, you know, what are some of the specific trends or patterns in cyber attacks that retailers are facing in today's market? So what we're seeing now is a lot of, perhaps you might call the same approaches that criminals use, but they're a lot more targeted and sophisticated at uh, the retailers uh, and their whole ecosystem that they operate in. Just think of um, the e-commerce exploits are out there. More and more of these um, organizations, even if they're a brick and mortar um, traditional institution or company, they now have an online presence. Uh, and and that's not just transacting perhaps with with their their clients, their supply, you know, their consumers, but also now with their suppliers. And so those are becoming quite easy 
or low-hanging fruit to cyber criminals to go and attack in a more sophisticated, pointed way. Um, just think of the amount of credentials that have been exposed now, it's millions and millions into the billions of records out there. So using AI and using other sophisticated technologies to exploit that is a, is a, is a really you could say targeted approach that um, the cyber criminals have in the retail industry in particular because of the sheer volume of transactions that retailers have. And then you look at um, supply chain dependencies, you just see the ripple effect that we've had with supply chain globally as well as nationally. And so again, cyber criminals can just pinpoint very carefully somewhere in the supply chain that significantly, with the ripple effect it has, impact not just one retail organization, but multiple retail organizations at the same time. And so again, that's been a lot more targeted and focused, focused by the cyber criminals. And the crazy thing is, is that these are such sophisticated attacks and they hit retail where it's most vulnerable. This is a this is a people business, right? With high turnover, lots of complexity. We outsource a lot of the things that really make retail go around to, to outside vendors and we bring on more and more suppliers and we we move quickly in this space. And to Jason's point, as these attacks become more sophisticated, it's often not the fault of the technologies or the places that we put things in, in to, to kind of prevent us from ourselves. It's human error, right? And it's decision making that always tends to be kind of at the root of these. And I think that is why retail is such a vulnerable space and why these breaches are so successful, especially in this emerging threat landscape. Yeah, and 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 the reality is, is that these retail organizations um, need to collaborate together in, in many ways. It's good that we're seeing ISACs now really take off in that space there where there is genuine collaboration, even against what I would call the frenemies within the, pardon me, the retail sector. But that means that there is an expectation now that there is a comprehensive approach to cybersecurity that these organizations are adopting, yet still having that balance there of understanding the beautiful innovation, the technology-driven innovation that these retailers have, still having that awareness amongst your employees, against your, your, your supply chain and against your, your um, customers, and at the same time, trying to balance all of that so you don't interrupt business, but in some ways become um, a brand enhancing capability if you play the cybersecurity card the right way. And then of course, more and more importantly now, like you have credit monitoring, you have all the other types of monitoring that, that retailers are focused on with their consumer base, the reality is you now need proactive cybersecurity monitoring around your digital landscape for um, a particular retailer company as it's running real time. Awesome. Well, gentlemen, uh, uh, for sure a, a significant area of risk here for retailers is data breaches, right? Uh, so I'm curious if, you know, how do you coach our clients and see the market uh, approaching that and thinking about the consequences around, you know, financial loss, reputational damage, trust from customers, you know, how do you prepare for that? And then in the event that something like that happens, how do you recover? Well, we see, I mean, there, there are a lot of numbers out there. In fact, it'd be hard to say this is the number for the financial impact of a, a, an incident or a data breach that a, a retailer uh, may be suffering. Uh, many times, though, you need to kind of break it into not only is it just perhaps um, the like legal fees, uh, potential fines uh, and penalties that you have to deal with now, but there's a lot of indirect costs that um, sometimes are just not um, quantifiable until it actually happens. Uh, you know, the actual revenue loss down to downtime, um, the unfortunate customer churn that you may have, uh, and then just the sheer effort to recover many, many times leaves companies off the air or really not operating at their operational best or where they used to be for weeks and sometimes months. So, you know, there, there are a lot of factors there that need to be brought together around when you just think about the financial loss. Yeah, when I think about that, talking to the line of business folks that I'm lucky enough to speak with is that just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? When it comes to data collection, I think there is this enormous pressure to build these hyper-personalized, very aware, contextually relevant experiences to do the things that we all want to do, which is to attract new customers to our brand, increase their, their loyalty and affinity with us, or even retain them for a much longer time through that, that life cycle with the customer. But it can't be at all costs, right? Just collecting information has to have a priority, right? It's expensive to hold and gather this information. And it opens up these security threats because we have it in all these different places and we're not really sure what we're doing with it. So 
I think it needs to be balanced with almost like a retention strategy, right? Security shouldn't be thought of as this overlay that keeps me from doing the things that I want to do as a line of business owner. It should be thought of as an, a, a retention strategy so I don't lose the goodwill that we've spent all this time and all this effort driving. And we certainly do not want to turn off potential customers because customers are more empowered with lower switching costs than they've ever have been, right? So if you show up in a place where you are a data breacher, you're not seem to be trustworthy, or you seem to be you know, flippant with their data and not respecting that, I do think that that's a, that's a business limiting priority that needs to be brought to the forefront of how we plan initiatives versus something that always has to come on later uh, as a bolt on to, to make sure we're doing it by the book, if you will. Right. And, and, and to, to, to link that to the other points of the question, we talked about reputational damage, we talked about the customer sort of loyalty and trust factors there. This is good examples where um, retailers that have a comprehensive information security program where they have proactively thought and planned and even tested their response plans. And those aren't at the macro level around technology. More often than not, it's about effective, honest and clear communication to their ecosystem, whether it is to their supply chain, whether it is to their their customers. Because in doing that, and you've just seen in you know, headlines of, of, of the last few months, some really good organizations who've suffered very embarrassing incidences and breaches have come out. They've explained very clearly and articulately what the issue is. They, if, if, if appropriate, they've apologized, et cetera. And actually what we've seen there is hardly any churn when it comes to the, the customer loyalty versus others who have done a very poor job in that effective communication. And frankly, that you know, yes, they have had not just the financial loss, but it's affected their reputation. And many, many customers that perhaps were theirs loyal for years are disappearing because of so easily the way that they can now just change their digital um, uh, calibrated environment and, and wait, there they go, they're now spending their money elsewhere. Is it fair to say it's not a matter of if, but when, Jason, in the retail space? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why we always recommend in your information security program to have that proactiveness in how you would be um, communicating with, when an incident happens. This episode is brought to you by Open Gear. Open Gear keeps your network running smoothly. OpenGear's network resilience platform allows you to effortlessly deploy, manage, and remediate your networks on the first day, worst day, and every day. I love that we speak about that too, as I think Jason is around resilience, right? And security, you know, not, it's a matter of, you know, Jay, you're saying like, not a matter of if but when, but how do you find the resilience to, to be in the right space there? So do you think that it is the case, you're sort of building on the conversation you've just had, do retailers see the protection of customer data as their top priority? Uh, or are there other things competing for that? And, and how do they, what's the best way to really address that from kind of a cultural norm within a retail organization or really any organization? Well, I mean, I, I can jump in straight away on that. I know Jay, we've talked about this previously, but absolutely data is important, not just in the retail industry, but you know, pretty much anywhere. With the whole digital revolution, it's all around data. Uh, the sheer amount of data that's generated now on planet Earth. You know, where is it? Who can touch it? Who owns it? Um, how to protect it? There's so many nuances that are there, never alone then the, uh, the sort of um, regulatory requirements that um, are, are held there. So absolutely, um, data is an important factor, and then how to protect that data is a critical concern for retailers. Yeah, I think on the surface level, that is the, the pat answer, right? I mean, no one was going to say that that's not important, but I think that we encourage the folks that we talk with Take a hard look. Are you enacting this when you get ready to roll out a new program? So think about something as basic as is optimizing a checkout flow or you know, multi-factor authentication. Our UX and design teams want that to be as frictionless and as easy for the consumer as possible sometimes at the detriment of security, right? Sometimes moving that and taking some of these controls out of place. So I think it's a balance of understanding that, yes, this is our most critical asset. This is our reputation. This is something that we work very, very hard to do. And we do want to serve frictionless customer experiences, but are there ways by which security has to enter into that so that we're not putting things at risk? And you know what? Customers are very, very comfortable being told why you need to go back through maybe a, a re-authentication process or why we're, and how we're going to use your information. So 
I, I think there's always a short circuit in retail to get to fewer clicks means more revenue or you know faster checkout means this. I think humans also don't want that natural flow to be compromised where it feels odd or you're using their data differently or you're asking them things that they're not prepared to do. Sometimes it's too easy to get through a checkout flow from some of the testing that we've done. So I think putting that at the forefront and making that part of how we think to keep them secure and to build and, and grow that trust is absolutely imperative. Yeah, and we've seen an evolution now. Um, and this is good. This is a good trend that we're seeing in the retail industry, where many times all they did was the compliance factor because it was forced on them. But actually what we're seeing positively in the industry is when there is a combination of some strong security practices with compliance and a few other things, um, then actually you are mitigating and reducing the risk there. And when you think around protecting sensitive data, especially customer data in that piece, I mean, some of the basics that even if you examine some of the headline breaches and incidents that are happening right now, just in North America, never alone around the world, you know, encryption wasn't effectively switched on and, and deployed across their environment. Tokenization wasn't. Um, there's a reason why the payment card industry has some standards and everyone's now focusing on version four and, and the nuances around there. But guess what? Th those have been working. Um, if at least those effective controls are put in place and the roadmap against that, because we'll go from four to whatever next in that. And those standards are very, very important, taking more and more into consideration, not only the data, but the data security aspects there. That in itself is important. And then Jay, you mentioned one of the most obvious things about MFA, the multi-factor authentication. That's not just there perhaps at the end with, our, with the, the users and the, the customers there, but throughout that IT uh, digital work stack that these um, retail organizations have. Well, gentlemen, I want to touch a little bit on, you know, in-store technologies, right? So for retailers, that's another aspect of the technology footprint and a space where you really have to find the right balance between, you know, security, uh, whether we're talking about point of sale systems, you know, wireless networking, sort of providing access to consumers, the business systems that are sort of running the operations of that retail location. Sometimes you have third party stuff that might be integrating at that store level or system level there. You know, how are organizations approaching providing that frictionless experience that we all seek as consumers with security in that store context? Well, Jay talked about um, earlier uh, in our conversation today about the security aspects trailing behind the radical beautiful innovation that retailers often are adopting and, and pushing into their environments. But there are some basics that if they're done from the beginning, we call it design in uh, the security factor into your development and operations environment. So we just, we mentioned one earlier around the multi-factor authentication. That's so important when systems and tools, as well as people interacting with the system and, and tools are there. That's one of the most obvious things that will lower risk in, um, in that space. Think about as well, we go back to the basics of people and process and technology. And when you think about store technology that's there, who are the people that are interacting with that? Uh, what do they do? Hence the process is there. And then how can you bring in that technology just in time in the most appropriate way and more often in the most minimalist way from a data dependency perspective to lower the risk around that? So if something or when something is compromised, the impact of that is significantly minimized versus again, as we've seen in the industry, that, that compromise being the back door into the whole environment where everything is then compromised from a business operations perspective, as well as just the customer data perspective. Uh, that is obviously perhaps one of those areas that are targeted. And I think you mentioned a really critical component there, which is the IT CISO group is never gonna understand the processes, the, the things that are in play as well as a business owner will, right? Or someone who's putting these in place. It's so important to get this upfront, to build this in, to Jason's point, it has to be proactive, right? It's easy to go find proof of concepts, especially in this world, right? Where we're trying to put in new and emerging, you know, IoT digital shelf edge, right? Type of things in the stores, but it can't be one off. It has got to go through that design for security at the beginning. And business knows that better than anyone. And it can't be a bolt on. It's got to be someone who drives that from the very, very beginning. So build those partnerships early so that these things find their way to fruition and we don't introduce additional risk into this whole ecosystem because it's only going to expand, right? Digital touch points are not slowing down in every business. Yeah. And I always meant to like to mention 
It's, we're beyond the buzzword of zero trust when we think of the zero trust methodology, the architectural frameworks around that. Again, you know, it's a combination of applying the people process and the technology. So one of the most important things here, whether you're talking about devices or people operating them or systems talking to each other, is that access controls and implementing strict access controls with you know, role-based permissions and, and then having a level of monitoring of that environment. And it doesn't have to be a detailed, comprehensive monitoring, but at least a monitoring of saying who's accessing this and to do what is a, is a really successful way of lowering risk. And, and those aren't comprehensive, significantly expensive um, measures that retailers can implement here. Some of these, they have the technology, it's just not switched on and configured appropriately to lower that risk factor. Well, gentlemen, no technology conversation today would be complete without talking a little bit about artificial intelligence, right? So I'm curious, you know, I know retailers in general are thinking about embracing AI and probably have been in some cases for years, but I'm curious your take on how artificial intelligence fits into the cybersecurity landscape uh, for retailers, both from the adversary side, as well as you know, from the, the retailer side, from the cybersecurity operations side. So what are you seeing out there with AI and, and what do we expect to see coming forward uh, in the next several years? Well, I can touch briefly on the AI um, piece in, in retail. When you think of cybersecurity that way, um, there's a lot there that can be used. And in fact, retailers are, are using it already. They're using it in, its, in their wider business there. But AI-powered AI systems that can analyze the vast amount of data that's out there to detect anomalies and to identify now the very sophisticated cyber threats are out there. Um, all of that is being shared uh, by government, by, by uh, other cybersecurity industry um, 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 entities. And so as a result of that, just using AI powered systems to look at the threats that are out there pretty much real time and see how they apply and contextualize to the retail environment um, uh, are starting to become and used effectively. And then you link that to what's called automated incident response. So when something is happening across that digital environment, again, AI is, is very effectively being used to respond, to isolate a device or um, a, a, a login credential or some sort of access control to do that. So again, in doing that, it's effectively reducing the impact of that incident or that breach that could be happening in real time rather than allowing it to be the enabler to bring down the whole company. Yeah, I think it just, again, it goes back to the, the vulnerability in retail is always back to the people, right? It's the decisions, it's who clicks on what. And I think the way that retailers are trying to use AI, especially through the lens of generative AI, to, to create better, more personalized content, to understand buying patterns more holistically, to understand Jason versus Jay versus Matt in terms of what we want to buy at any given point, know that that is actually happening against the employees that are in your corporation, right? It's the exact flip around. Just as retail creates marketplaces to sell goods and services, the bad guys are doing the exact same thing. There are marketplaces around malware. There's a, things that are emerging all over the place. So if you kind of flip the script around the things that we're doing can be used against us, knowing that these tools now exist when like smart folks like Jason exist in the world to advise against that. It's just, again, it goes back to training, it goes back to good decision-making, and it goes back to just understanding the way that we have to be thoughtful and cognizant about how we deploy, train, and empower people, right, to, to make good decisions, and then also having that security posture up front to be able to limit when, in this, when this happens, right? Because it's not if, again. Yeah, I, I'd summarize, summarize it as we're seeing really, really effective AI enabled security defense activities happening across the retail sector. And of course, the cyber criminals are doing the same the other way. But at the moment, we're seeing some really positive ways that the retail industry is applying the use of AI when it comes to cybersecurity defense. If you think about that, though, what's driving a lot of the sheer amount of data and the transactions that are involved there is the sort of IoT side of it and the other side of the question there. Um, there's a lot of digital devices now within the environments, whether it's a quick service restaurant right the way up to a comprehensive um, 
um, hotel or, or just your high street retailer. They're trying to, in many ways, digitize the in-person experience as well as the remote experience at the same time. And to do that, significant amount of technology is being deployed um, in those environments. Everything from the, the cameras uh, that are there, that are not just looking, but they're now evaluating. Um, the sensors that go with that, we've already mentioned the point of sale systems that are there. And, and one of the things that's happening, and this is happening broader than the retail industry, is what we call that physical and cyber convergence when it comes to a digital experience, but at the same time, a cyber security experience at the, um, um, as we bring those things together. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, last question for you. So imagine I'm an executive, senior executive with a retailer. We're sitting down, we're having a cup of coffee, and I'm going to ask you, you know, what are the one or two things I need to be really mindful of when it comes to cybersecurity for our business as a retailer? What are you telling that person? The first thing I would say is actually have a cybersecurity or an information security program that's looking at the people that you've got the processes and the technologies. And that might sound simple, but actually what we see in the retail industry is a lot of response and firefighting rather than a program that is trying to support the company where it is now and where it's going. So actually adopting and having a, a, an information security program that's aligned to the digital journey of the company is the first thing that many overlook that, assuming it's there, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. And I think taking when i talk to a lot of business owners i think it's about this isn't a layer that comes after you've made your decisions or the, the initiatives that you want to put into place right i firmly believe that this is a differentiator for growth and for building brand affinity and loyalty going forward right we are dealing with some more emerging customer classes that are going to be very very powerful in a few years who understand data they're happy to give that to you if you use that well they you they understand you're going to deliver them an experience that is value based but these things are going to become that much more important as this more digitally savvy consumer group continues to evolve takes more share of who we all want to target in the retail space it has to be thought of as Cybersecurity is, is not a drag. It is a growth and differentiator going forward, and it is going to differentiate companies in new and emerging retail space. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Jay, Jason, thanks so much for being with us here today. It's good. Thank you very much. Thanks, yeah. Matt. Hey, and thank you for joining us as well. Another great expert session. And this is one of a four-part series we have on retail. So if you enjoyed this one, uh, you can visit with me and Jay to look at AI and data, cloud, and also unified commerce as the other three in this four-part series. We've got a great back catalog of episodes you can watch anytime on WWT.com. Lots more coming up in the future, so you can check out the calendar for that. And we always hear, love hearing your feedback. So uh, take some time to do that survey or just drop us an email and let us know how we did. And with that, we will wrap today's session. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next time.